You are listening to Demystifying Organizations. In partnership with McGraw-Hill Education, I'm your host, Jeff Shatton. My guest today is Nancy Kane, who is a historian at the Harvard Business School. Kane's research focuses on how leaders, past and present, craft life, lives of purpose, worth, and impact. Her book, Forged in Crisis, The Power of Courageous Leadership in Turbulent Times, is an enthralling historical narrative filled with critical leadership insights. Kane is the author of numerous books, articles, and Harvard Business School cases. She writes frequently for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Harvard Business Review Online. She is also a weekly commentator on National Public Radio and has appeared on PBS's NewsHour, ABC's Good Morning America, a and Biography, and on CNN and MSNBC, among others. She has coached leaders in many organizations and speaks at the World Economic Forum in Davos, the Aspen Ideas Festival, and many other venues. She has a PhD in history from Harvard. I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Nancy Kane. Thanks so much for joining me. It's a real pleasure, Jeff. So in, in your book, Forged in Crisis, you cover a wide variety of leaders from uh, various times facing um, a bunch of different challenges. You know, what are some of the lessons that, we, that leaders or, or managers or listeners should take away from the leaders that you profile in terms of you know, how, do they deal, how do you deal with changing goals and decision-making under uncertainty? So just by way of a little bit of background, the book is a really a group biography. It, co- it covers five leaders, Ernest Shackleton, the Antarctic explorer, Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, Frederick Douglass, the African-American abolitionist and escaped slave, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, much less well known, I have noted to at least American li- uh, listeners and readers. Yeah, I had never, I had not, I had not heard of him before. Yeah, he's by far and away the least well known. He was a minister, a Lutheran minister, who came of age in uh, the 1930s as the Nazis were coming to power and became a quite extraordinary leader within uh, initially the theological and then later the political and the political resistance within inside the Nazi government trying to assassinate Hitler. Um, And then last, but by no means least, Rachel Carson, the woman who more than any other single person jump-started the environmental movement with the publication of an amazing and astounding book uh, called Silent Spring. So each of these people um, find themselves, and this is where the stories all open, in the midst of a completely unexpected and potentially catastrophic crisis. And it's, it's a personal crisis, but it ha- because it's personal, it affects everything in their life. And therefore, the, 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 the purpose of the book, of each of the stories, and, to, and the, weaving the connections among the stories, is to understand how their, each of these individuals' ability, which they made up in some cases as they went along, which they had honed in some other ways as they walked their path, which in some cases they just prayed and took a leap of faith, their ability to navigate through the storms, these huge winds and you know very high waves, turned out to have an enormous impact on their leadership, on how they led, on how they refined or, or stumbled into their purpose, and most important in some pragmatic sense, on their, their impact then and now. So the book is really a storybook with a bunch of lessons in it, about how modern leaders from any kind of organization or purpose or walk of life or situation can make themselves much better in the midst of crisis. Um, Some of it, again, on the fly, but some of it done every day in our lives. And and so so it's a very unusual leadership book, but it's really primarily a storybook because I don't have any, you know, PowerPoint slides and I don't have Right. Seven, seven habits of highly organized strategic people, etc. Um, but what I do have are these amazing stories, which, as Henry Kissinger once said, happen to be true, of four very different people in four, excuse me, five very different people in five very different contexts who learn to lead and to make themselves stronger, more resilient, more, uh, more effective 
as as courageous leaders in crisis. So that's the foundation of the book. And and now last to get to your question, I think one of the one of the critical lessons that each of them learned because what I discovered, you know, working through these putting these stories together bit by putting the book took me about 14 years from start to finish. Wow. Yeah. Um, what I learned, one of the most important things that, that I learned as I was going through is that each of them discover very early on in the midst of their crisis, or in, in most cases, actually earlier than this, but then it becomes critically important during these moments of turbulence, they each discover the power of, of, of owning their own emotional awareness and trying to use it as a tool. Um, that, that takes many, many different uh, forms, if you will, in their leadership. But the first thing that it does for all of them is to give them the ability to look inside themselves in a crisis. And for example, in Lincoln's case, or in Ernest Shackleton's case, when he's stranded on the ice with 27 men, he's responsible for, you know, in the middle of the Antarctic Sea, what it gives them the, the, the capability to do is to say, I need to slow down and find out where my muscles of resilience, forbearance, and, you know, and in serious, you know, improvisation are, because there's a lot of improvisation in each of these stories. And so they're always checking in with themselves before they're taking external action. So yeah, I thought it, I thought it was interesting, um, especially when you mentioned uh, Shackleton and Lincoln, um, how aware they are of how their emotions impact other people. Exactly. Um, which is which is definitely something that we use in the 21st century business classroom. Um, but these concepts of, uh, of emotional intelligence and emotion regulation and being aware of your own emotions and how your emotions impact others um, and how other people r- relate um, emotionally to the world um, didn't exist. And you and you chart through how they, um, without any framework, um, are are using those skills. Exactly. Exactly. And they're all using them. We you know, again, all of them with potentially Rachel Carson exception before any of this language, this kind of scholarship, this kind of model making appear, they're doing it through experience and they're doing it through uh, the second thing that each. So, so each of them learn that if they're going to get something done in crisis, it's worthy and they're not going to collapse. And sometimes they're just navigating as we all are in periods of great difficulty, step by step. If they're going to be able to do that, um, and, and, and therefore regulate control, as you just said, you know, manage their impact on, on other people uh, step by step or, you know, always with regard to a mission, then they're going to have to get better. They're going to have to pull from their best selves. So that's a really important lesson, right? It's a very conscious, intentional um, you know, applied awareness that they each of these people use over and over. I, uh, you know, Rahm Emanuel, quoting someone whom I can't remember, once said that, you know, every crisis is a huge opportunity. No crisis, every, every crisis is too important to be wasted. These people understand that completely, but they understand it in a very important and different way than a lot of the modern commentators have talked about that phrase. They're talking about a crisis is a crucible, a chance to make myself better, stronger, right, more resilient, and to move my mission and myself forward on a worthy path even more effectively than I did before. The, the other thing that um, seems to cut across many of them, and I don't think you discussed this, but is the idea of meta-awareness. So they seem to be aware that they're aware, so that there's a um, there's a second-order planning and cognition that's beyond their uh, immediate experience of the events. Um, whereas it seems like most people in a crisis, I think of even myself or um, pretty much anybody I've, I've worked with, um, there's, it's just the first order of thinking because right. you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Um, and, uh, you o- often lose track of that strategic piece. Um, and, uh, most of the leadership profile do such an amazing job of this, um, almost a meta awareness, um, type processing. So I don't use that language, but I think that's exactly right, Jeffrey. What I use is the ability, I keep calling it the ability to see the big picture. So even though Rachel Carson is diagnosed with this extraordinarily aggressive metastasizing cancer before chemotherapy and with most likely a short time to live, she can see in the midst of that, you know, extraordinarily difficult situation, right? One that threatens her very life. She can, she can see very clearly the impact of the work that she is making and of the critical importance both to herself and her sense of her own purpose and life and, you know, worth 
And even more important, this is what you're talking about, the ability of what this may mean right now at this moment in history to get this book out mm-hmm. on the right runway and or the effect that will have toward you know cultivating, nurturing, really um, executing on what today we'd call serious environmental stewardship and, and so she can, she can she can always access that even in her most her her moments of you know the deepest darkest right sense of herself or the the what shakespeare once called the dark night of the soul ditto for lincoln he you know he is as he once said he said many times i am environed by difficulties at various points as the commander in chief during the civil war but he never loses sight of if i collapse even though he wanted to, even though he threatened to Stanton, Edwin Stanton, his war secretary, and others to kill himself at a couple of junk, terrible junctures in the war, he, he understood if I collapse, if I don't can't find the will to take the next step, the whole damn thing will collapse. Mm-hmm. So this ability to realize this is the big picture right now, and I have impact on that, and I owe it to myself and to my mission to keep going and to respond to that awareness is really important. That may be in some ways the best or most luminous lesson of the book because we all have the capability to, to do this. I mean, these, these people, and this is, this is a really important part of the book that I have great pains to emphasize. These people were not, extra, they were not born extraordinary. They were not born iconic leaders. They were not born, you know, as as you know, as individuals cut from the rib of Zeus and and ready to leap tall buildings in a single bound, these were absolutely ordinary people, endowed with some gifts, but who made themselves step by messy step and with lots of setbacks and in all the cases many more failures than triumphs into people who could do something extraordinary. So the so real. You- the real call, the real gauntlet of the book that I offer to readers is pick this up. You can do this, but you're going to work, have to work on yourself and you're going to have to access that kind of awareness, your, what you call meta-awareness, and you're going to have to play to your stronger side more than your weaker side. So your, your writing um, is classically opposed to the trait-based um, features of leadership research, which basically argues that leaders are born. And that, so the trait side of the literature would say that there's, you know, there's certain person, personality characteristics or intelligence profiles or things that you're largely born with that makes a leader who they are. Um, and so that would be the equivalent of that I happen to be five foot four. So I do not have those inborn traits for basketball, where somebody who's six foot 10 um, and certain um, uh, natural athletic ability is kind of given those uh, traits. Um, so what, what, uh, so you, you kind of take the other side of that discussion um, and explain to our listeners kind of your perspective on why um, on, on why you take the leaders sure. are not born uh, so, mantra. And I, and I do it unabashedly and, you know, and, and joyfully because I, I know I'm right. Um, I'm not, I'm right. This, it's not about being right. It's about what is. And, and I'm not saying I take the other side. No, I'm just presenting. No, you're very uh, yeah. I'm presenting. Important. Yeah, but in the literature, this is like this Absolutely. is a serious. It's a very it's a it's a serious stream of the literature that would that argues the traits. And if we if we turn away from literature, just into the, like the modern world of in my in my world, the modern the world of modern corporations and and the implicit assumptions. I mean, think about CEO pay in the United States. The implicit assumption of a, C, a CEO of a public company making you know between four and five hundred dollars times more. On an annual basis than the average employee, that has to be based on a born not made. Because if we were all capable of being CEOs, we we wouldn't have corporate boards and compensation committees, and and you know headhunters that were playing the kind of compensation game we are. So we all, I think, there's a lot. This the the idea that leaders are born is an enormously powerful one right now. It, it's just wrong. And how do I know it's wrong? Or how do lots of people know it's wrong? I'm by no means the only one saying this. Well, I, it's because I'm a, I'm a detective and all historians do is look at the record of what is and what was. And it's just so clear. And I've been studying leaders at Harvard Business School, past and present for 30 years. Um, and it's just so clear that the best leaders are people who were made not, not primarily a function of nature. And it's, I'm not trying to suggest that nature plays absolutely no role, um, but, but nurture and, what we, and, and the, and the co- commitment to better oneself ultimately, ultimately play a much greater role. And that's evident in all, all five of these people, all of whom with one exception were born with nothing, very, very little, and come from very, very little and 
re- and really develop into extraordinary people. In any event, the really important thing there is that leaders from Catherine Graham, who if you know her story, a personal story, or Marion Wright Edelman, or uh, Abraham Lincoln, or um, uh, all kinds of other leaders, um, Oprah Winfrey, all you can just name a host of people from lots and lots of different realms, um, Elijah Cummings, John Lewis, uh, from lots and lots of different realms. These are, these are people who um, ha, you know, had, had, had certainly had natural gifts, but who the making of their themselves as leaders was, again, a consciously intentional right expedition lifelong expedition that that in which the making the 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 abilities that they cultivated the tools that they accessed the impact that they could take stock of and then try and enhance and channel were greatly deepened during periods of personal testing personal crises failure setback so a, a fourth kind of takeaway from the book is you want to make yourself into a great leader guess what it will turn out whether you're directing a local food bank, trying to keep the public library open longer, or going to run for state senate, or found your own company. Mark Zuckerberg could learn a lot through the crisis of his company right now in terms of deepening and enhancing his leadership. It's not clear that's going to happen, right? I'm not saying (laughs) this is a given. I'm saying you can choose to walk into a crisis, especially one in which you are chastened and become much better. I'm not sure that's going to happen with Mr. Zuckerberg, but in any event, the, the, the point here is you, these moments are actually more than moments in which we get to run around with our head, with, with, with our run around like chickens with our head cut, cut, cut off. We're all going to do that to a certain extent. We can actually take a deep breath. As Ecclesiastes says in the Apocrypha, make no haste in times of calamity and figure out what do I want to emerge? How do I want to emerge from this? Do I want to emerge bigger? stronger, more understanding? Do I want to lo- what do I want to learn from this hideous, gross, right? Very, very fearful moment I'm in. And why how might that matter to the world? And each of these people did that over and over. And it's a tremendous anecdote or tonic to the, oh my God, well, look at what's happening to me. I don't know what to do. I'm so upset. I'm, I'm just spinning, which we all do a lot in our hyper-connected, multitasking world. But history suggests unequivocally that that is not the way forward to courageous, effective, worthy leadership. So so I'd like to um, kind of refocus to this um, question about whether leaders are uh, are born or made, because I think it's such an important discussion. Um, There's a a big difference between what we call um, leader emergence and leader effectiveness. So... um, what, what predicts who becomes um, in a leadership position or who becomes a CEO, who becomes a president is often very different than who's the best at it. And one of the things that the trait, the trait side is really good at is predicting leader, uh, uh, leader emergence. Um, this would be things like presidents are almost always over six feet tall. Um, people that are more extroverted often end up in uh, stronger, leader, uh, stronger leadership position, positions. Um, for networking purposes, for biases, um, for, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, leader effectiveness um, is, a is, is the other side of the coin where you want to understand you know, who's more effective. And, and that's where you start seeing that, you know, in fact, extroverts are not necessarily better leaders than introverts, yeah. Yeah. though they are more likely to end up in those positions. Um, somebody who is tall is not necessarily more effective at being a leader than somebody who's not tall. Um, and so there, there seems to be a big split because of, uh, discrimination, uh, biases and, and other, and other factors in terms of who emerges as, as a position. And to me, one of the downstream effects is that because leader emergence, um, can be, you know, is often associated with, like with the six foot tall, um, president for the public, people start seeing, oh, and this is what an effective leader is. Because when I look around and I look around at leaders, in fact, I do see people that are tall or extroverted um, or something else that, that predicts leader emergence. So I want to know if, if that – and feel free to disagree. Like, uh, I wanted to kind of throw that over to you. I, I couldn't agree – well, I couldn't agree more with you about the, distinct, the distinction between effectiveness and emergence. Um, but emergence isn't worthy. Emergence isn't effective. Or emergence isn't you know, moving the boulder of goodness forward. Emergence is I got the power or I got the position or I stepped onto the stage, that may be necessary or may not to huge impact. And 
just like and in those cases, being an extrovert, being tall in some instances, right, speaking well publicly are very useful. But again, consider someone like Rachel Carson, for example, who was shy and retiring and different and very, very feminine in a classic sense of that word. And, you know, liked being home at her writing desk with her cats rather than at Washington cocktail parties, even though she rose quite high in the federal government working for the Fish and Wildlife Service and wrote the most powerful, one, arguably one or two, one, two, three, of one of the top three most powerful books in the 20th century in English that changed the whole world. And so what do we do with that? Well, we, we say she, that's a leader, right? But it's not a leader cut from the same cloth that we're talking about in terms of lead. That's not leader emergence. That's leader effectiveness. So I'm interested in that because I'm a historian and, I, and I'm tenured. And so I get the luxury of choosing, <laughs> what, choosing what I do. I choose to write about stories of effect, leader effectiveness. That's what I'm really interested in. And I think actually that's what the, the world needs more of right now because there's so, so much at stake in so many different parts of our, of our global village right now. We really want leaders to be thinking about how can I be as effective as I as possible on a worthy cause, whether again that be of you know dealing with the massive no- amounts of n- numbers of extinctions right now, or I'm going to really develop a killer clean energy company that's going to really really reduce fossil fuel um, fossil fuel dependence. So there's many. So the leader effectiveness seems to me so much more interesting and important yeah, I agree. from at least from a historian's storytelling. Mm-hmm ability and my ability through stories to reach people and motivate them in any kind of walk of life where they have a worthy highway they want to get on. So so that that's really not a direct answer to it. It's an answer that 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 sure. highlights the distinction and says, I think, and this is a final thing I'll say, I think that in a little bit we have been sold and we have accepted, we have swallowed uh, you know, a, a kind of placebo or poison pill around what constitutes leadership in this country. I wrote a piece right after the book came out because I was struck by this issue, although I didn't articulate it nearly as well as you did, Jeffrey, about effectiveness and emergence. And I talked about we're, we're, we're buying leadership bling when we buy, <laughs> when we buy really something about, well, he's, look how well connected he is, or how many times has he appeared on Saturday Night Live? I'm literally talking about presidential candidates. Or mm-hmm. how many celebrities from Hollywood are giving this person money like that, 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 that has something to do with effectiveness. It has, I mean, excuse me, emergence has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with our ability as voters or citizens or constituents or stakeholders or members of some kind of movement to move the boulder, the purpose of that leader forward and for us to, you know, benefit from it or the world to benefit from it. So, so I think, I think we part have to of the be pro- more discerning, excuse me, we have to be more discerning and we, and the, and the media and writers on leadership owe it to the, to the public to be more careful about this. So I, I think it's, I think it's a, just a part of the flaw in the human condition or maybe in our DNA is that we like what's shiny. Um, yeah. and, and, and I, I don't, I don't see, I don't see an easy correction for that. Um, it, it, unless you have somebody who's really thinking hard about, um, outcomes versus, you know, what is your idea of who a leader is, um, versus, you know, who's, who's more likely to bring the outcomes that you want. Um, I think people uh, have shown the pattern of this and will likely continue to do so is to vote for, um, in the public sense or, um, in a publicly traded company, elect to, um, the CEO and CFO, um, positions, the people that fit that archetype. Um, well, you know, maybe, maybe you're right. I, I, I don't, I, you know, and, and there's no question that, that people will continue to consume this if it's fed, it, it tastes good, right? You said the shiny new object is very alluring, but, but it doesn't reduce the responsibility or, or of storytellers or those of us that try and find the historical truth. It is out there. It's not a truth. It's the truth. I'm trying to, to understand and articulate that character and competence are not the same things as connection and body height, and that we owe it to people to cultivate their ability to think about those things. Because just as true as people will, will bite for the shiny new object, they recognize real substance and real decency when it is put before them. So, so yeah, so you, so you write a lot about character and values. Um, that, that, that comes up throughout. Um, throughout. Um, so I want to address uh, this in a couple ways. Um, 
and this will we'll have a little discussion on one on on the first part. Um, so there's a split um, oftentimes between uh, values and strategy, and um, you sometimes these are aligned. Where what makes the most sense for a company or for an organization um, strategically is aligned with their values, and sometimes that splits where um, you're at attention and you have to figure out: Am I going to go with what I really value, um, or what is uh, most expedient? And I just want to I just want to discuss Abraham Lincoln because I think he's the most complex in this in this matter. Okay. Um, so there's there's I, I recommend this for anybody. There's an amazing essay by by Richard Hofstadter called American Lincoln and Self Made Myth, and he goes through um, really uh, not not calling it values versus strategy, but addressing that um, where the times that President Lincoln was expedient and the time that it, when he was not. And, and there's, there's one part, there's just one part of the essay that I want to draw your attention to and, and, uh, and, and get your reaction. Um, he gives a speech in Charleston um, in 1858. I'm just going to read a line from it's this. Part, I know this very well. It's part of this, the, the debates with Stephen Douglas. Yeah, yeah. To run, sorry, run for the U.S. Senate. So, so I'm going to start, sorry, I'm going to start with Chicago. In Chicago, he says, uh, let us discard all these things and unite as one people throughout this land until we shall once more stand up declaring that all men are created equal. Um, and then just, just a few days later, uh, a couple months later, he's, he speaks in Charleston um, where he says, and I quote, I will say that I am not nor have ever been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, that I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. Um, so on the one hand, and this is, and Hofstetter goes down and it's a, it's a really brilliant essay, I'm looking at... Um, these splits within Lincoln, and on the other, and, and this, and you tend to you focus on um, the way that he, you know, saving of the union, um, ultimately coming to the point of uh, where he's committed to um, ending slavery. So, I guess maybe I'm, I'm, what I'm asking is for Abraham Lincoln specifically, and just this incredible tension between strategy and values, and then more broadly. Um, you know, how do how do we all come to terms with this when every one of us struggles at times when our values do not align with our own um, uh, best interests? Okay, well, well, this is really the subject of a very long conversation because I know the Hofstetter essay like I know you know my horse's markings or my nail beds. I know it so well. Uh-huh. I think it's one of the best essays written in the 20th century in the field of history. And for readers that or listeners that don't know it, it's from a book called The American Political Tradition. It's a tiny bit hard to find, but well worth the effort. Uh, let me start with the end of Hofstetter's essay, which was tremendously influential for me, but by no means the defining you know, reference, if you will, in my own theory of Lincoln, and then, and then respond, respond in this way. So first, Hofstetter ends the essay, and it's incredibly beautifully written, um, as you well know, Jeffrey, he ends it by saying, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln was, had the, 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 the White House changed him. The power changed him. The, the blood, the shock and awe of the Civil War, the blood on his hands changed him. And it helped him grow significantly. He's not, he's, he can join a long, long, long list of historians and Lincoln experts who, who have come to that conclusion, including myself. And so he doesn't quite end where you think he's going to end when you begin the essay. And he shouldn't because Lincoln, like all of us, was a work in progress. That's, that's the real answer here. Lincoln was a work in progress. And the gap between his strategic, his words and his actions and his deepest held, his most deeply held values shrunk as he, as the war progressed um, within the confines of exigency of military fortunes and his electability to take a second term as president and all these critical large historical forces that were driving everyone at that critical moment in American history. So the first thing is Lincoln grew and changed. Secondly, the, the the comments, the, dis- the discrepancy between the comments, which you can find all over Lincoln's election um, efforts, both for the Senate uh, a couple of times in Illinois in the 50- 1850s and then as president, are what are, are political, you know, there, there are a po- politician selling himself differently for different audiences. Um, I don't have anything to say about that except that Lincoln was a very good politician. And that doesn't justify it. It just says he, right. he acted no differently than than all the Democratic and Republicans on the stage right now, including our president, (laughs) who are trying to sell themselves to different groups of supporters. Uh, That doesn't justify it. It just says you understand it better in that context. Um, The the third thing to say, which is more to your general point. So 
and, and perhaps just to segue from Lincoln to the to the general point about all of us, um, I think there are pieces that Lincoln scholars have missed about his growth that carry us back to his early encounters with great failure and, and grief um, that that come that come in the White House in this extraordinary crucible where he is sitting at the center of the perfect storm. I actually discovered Lincoln. I was trained as a European historian when my own life started collapsing in 2003 and my husband had left. My father died. I got cancer. I got cancer again. I lost all of my Harvard retirement. It was a terrible, terrible Hmm. patch of my life and it came fast and furious. And I didn't sleep for a year or so. And I started reading Lincoln late at night and discovered one day, not very long into it, that like reading his speeches, his memos, his letters, that, you know, I said to myself, Nancy, you think you have problems. Lincoln had them much worse. And and, and so I got interested in Lincoln for personal reasons. But Lincoln was case, Lincoln Lincoln was your job? He he was. And he was like a yeah. White House. Like how did he navigate through this? But here's my point about Lincoln to get to the larger point. You know, Lincoln got access to his most deeply held values. He got access through repeated encounters with storms and calamity and setbacks to his own muscles of resilience and his muscles of moral courage. And these things come together, right? The access to the values in circumstances that are very dire, the access to courage and the experience along the way to know I can get through this because I've gotten through so much before. And that is what connects, starts to connect, say, the amount, the, 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 the military defeats of 1862 on the northern side with the Emancipation Proclamation and the decision to bring black troops into the mix in the, for the northern side. And then the absolute, absolute right, refusal of Lincoln to broker a negotiated peace through the terrible year of 1864 until he's reelected. So you see in him, as we'd hope in many of us, if we could ask ourselves what we'd really like for our lives – a closing or a shrinking of that gap between values and actions, between values and and and, and purpose. And and that that is something that, that all of us have access to. We, we can't we can't use it every single day, but like the core of the book, it behooves us to keep emotional awareness of that. We're all gonna make compromises, right? We're all gonna think about, you know, the things we have the contingencies we have to work around. But if we lose sight of what we, we deem to be our, our, our worthy purpose, then we're going to stray further and further, right, away from our most deeply held values because the world will not re- reward us, right, will not put us in a default setting that takes us toward our, our d- deeply held and cherished values. So I want to I I provide my lens, and I'm saying this not as a historian whatsoever, um, but in terms of decision making, so uh, just for, forgive me. I'm, I, you know, I, my my knowledge of Lincoln is obviously um, pretty limited uh, compared to yours. Um, but there's a there's a there's a statement that Lincoln said where he says, um, more or less. I'm just going to paraphrase. Um, if it, I want to save the Union. If it if it means that we had to have slavery with the Union, I'd be okay with that. If it means that slavery ends. Um, I'd be okay with that too, but my my over my whole goal is to save the union, and I think of this in terms of first order priorities and second order priorities. And to me, as I think of Lincoln, um, I think of this as a classic decision making framework, which is that, and this is not he, you know he's not in 2019 with 2019 priorities. He is a, he's a product of his time, and as he's assessing the situation, his number one and chiefly number one goal is to save the union. And, and to me, that's why you see him so conflicted in terms of his statements over and over. And it's, it's not just the ones that I read. Um, you see this um, throughout his life, uh, varying statements about slavery. But the one thing he does not change on is his supreme desire to save the union. Um, so I, I see it less in that, um, it, in a, even a values versus a strategy question, but that he had one overarching goal, which might be at odds with his second goal. Like, I, you know, clearly he, he would, he would, you know, he would like to see slavery end. Um, but it, he was not going to let his second goal, um, her second tier goal, uh, supersede his, pri- his top priority. So I, I need to have to have to respond to that. This is a big, important yeah. part, argument in my book. And I'm not, I'm not really the first to make it this way, but I make it again from this look at Lincoln's emotional experience. I, that's what distinguishes my work from anybody else on Lincoln. Um, 
So Lincoln, indeed, he makes that statement in a letter in August of 1862 to Horace Greeley, a very important pub- newspaper publisher in New York. I, you know, if I could save the union, save the union by freeing all the slaves, I would. If I could save the union by freeing none of the slaves, I would. If I could save the union by freeing half the slaves and leaving half the slaves enslaved them, I would. I would save the union. That that is that is a political document issued very, very intentionally, very cal- with a lot, great deal of calculation to, in a sense quell all converse, all public chattering about what he's going to do about slavery. It's to say, I'm for the union and nothing else. He has by, but here's the thing. That's what he says publicly. He's already Mm -hmm. moved a great deal internally toward where, where, what his goal is. His goal becomes, and it's, it's absolutely manifest, say by March or April of 1863, three months after the Emancipation Proclamation becomes law. His goal is absolutely clear. It is, I would save and transform the union. So the union I will save will be a different union than the union we went into battle with. It will be a union where everyone is free, right? That, that, is, a cri- that is a critical transformation in Lincoln. And he's already a large way there when he puts that, when he puts that, that letter to the editor in the post to Horace Greeley. So if I'm, if I'm going to paraphrase what you're saying... Um, are you, so you're saying that it's true. His initial goal was more Absolutely. just of, yep. ju- was was ex- expediency, just save the union. And well, then, it was an expediency. He didn't. He was not as much more than expediency, but save what he thought called the last great hope of man on earth. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, but but a strategic question. His his first order goal: save the union. Yep. And then what you're saying is that he he went through this massive transformation, and then when he came out the other end. Um, that the the slavery issue was front and center was it, 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 and, I, it and I'm gonna ask like so, it, did it start to supersede his other one was it equal the, to the union the title of the 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 the, the biography on Lincoln is save and transform the nation mm-hmm. so link so Lincoln who starts off you know issues his first uh, inaugural address saying I won't make we don't want to make war I don't want to interfere with slavery I want to save the union I, I'm called to do that by my constitutional responsibility becomes, through the crucible of war, a person, a leader, who says it's not enough to save the Union. It's got to be a Union in which there is no more slavery, because that's what Thomas Jefferson meant in the Declaration of Independence. And we had, shall we say, a cancer on, the, on society that has lived for a long time, and now we're going to excise it. And how do we know that's the case? Well, when you read the chapter, when your listeners read the chapter, they'll see at what, at what pains I and can many, many other historians have been to reconstruct this transformation within Lincoln that becomes so important in, in his leadership. But just a couple of a couple of notes so of how we know that, that the goal is now a broader one than save the union as it existed in 1860, or save the union as it came out of the Constitutional Convention in 1787. It's save the union and restore the promise of America, equality for all, right? That's the end of the first paragraph of the Gettysburg Address. And how do we know that? Two, just two instances. There's many, many more, and they're they're really, they're really they're detailed in some in some measure and in some frequency in the book. Um, he, in 1864, he's offered a number of opportunities to sue for a negotiated peace. This is when the South is transcend is, is ascendant in terms of military fortunes, and he's going to get defeated at, at, in the polls by George McClellan, the Democratic nominee for president, and all hope is lost. And he does not. And he actually calls in Frederick Douglass, dear listeners, Frederick Douglass, mm-hmm. to advise him on what to do. And Douglas says, do not even think of, of, of suing for a negotiated peace. You, you, you are committed to this. It's your legacy. You will, you, the world will never forgive you. And he backs completely away from it and just soldiers on. And then, of course, Sherman, General Sherman, Tecumseh Sherman takes Atlanta and the, the, the pendulum of military advantage switches, shifts decisively to the north. That's example one. Another example that's even more telling is right after the election of 1864, in which a whole bunch of new Republicans are elected because it's clear the North is going to win the war. Lincoln's elected very heavily, my, my friends, by, by votes from soldiers in the field, um, and who, many of whom are black and many of whom are white fighting for the first time along black soldiers. Um, in, in, he devotes an enormous amount of political capital in January of 1865 to passing the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery forever, he will devote equal amounts of capital and lay a critically important groundwork to the, to the 14th and 15th Amendment. The 14th Amendment um, grants citizenship to every black American. The 15th Amendment grants, grants suffrage to male black Americans. And, and those would never have become part of the Bill of Rights 
if if Lincoln hadn't done the groundwork. So that's not the. That's really interesting. That's yeah. not. These are not the actions of a man who's whose priority number one is solely to save the union as it was when the war broke out. That, that's really interesting. Um, I like I, I like that part about the about, about the transformation. Um, the the one that the, what I think of and just on the along these lines of values versus strategy. Um, I think of Obama in terms of gay marriage. So in the late '90s, there's there's been uh, documents that's that's been found that you know Obama was very clearly uh, pro gay marriage, and um, in the 2000s and starting in 2004 when he became a, a national figure, um, and certainly by 2006 when he was um, you know going to be running for president, um, he he said he was not for gay marriage but for civil rights. Um, once he was elected president, he said he was not for gay marriage, but for civil rights. And then ultimately down the road, when he was um, in a position to, to weigh in, um, on, he kind of came out as being um, pro-gay yeah. marriage. Yeah. And uh, my thinking on this and why I just, I, I find this question of values versus strategy just so essential um, because I don't think there's a very clear answer is that had Obama come out in 2004, 2006 as pro-gay marriage, he, he would not have been electable. Yeah. Um, today, of course, it's a, it's a non-issue. Um, but in 2006, he would not have been he would not have been electable, and so I'm just putting myself in his mind. Um, is I would like to I'd like to be someone who ushers in gay marriage. The only way that I can do so is to come out in public and say I'm against gay marriage. Um, well, there you go. I mean, I, I think that's a great example. It's pertinent to Lincoln. It's pertinent to lots of people who get really important, decent things done, but have to gain the access to the the levers to do that. And and, and by the way, you could argue. Saving the Union without slavery became became Lincoln's mission, just like civil rights grew for Obama to incorporate gay marriage. That's a critical civil right. Uh, and P.S. Look how far the this is the last point. P.S. Look how far the country has traveled since then. We're now the, you know, one of the third or four, three or four leading candidates for the Democratic nomination right now is Pete Buttigieg. That's unthinkable yeah. in two thousand and six. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the point. Lincoln, like Obama, Obama, like Lincoln, your smart leaders are always calculating, right, where their followers and where the larger body politic, the largest group of stakeholders is. So Lincoln could never have won the presidency by saying, I'm going to get in there. And if we have a war, I'm going to end slavery. That, that wouldn't have been possible in 1861. By a year and a half into this war that was bloody beyond belief, the abolition movement had gone on steroids, too. And Americans were thinking very differently in lots of quarters about slavery. Um, so so th- that the last point is smart leaders are always in touch with the changing sensibilities of the moment. And, and that's what Obama saw as well as, you know, here, I, I can't get elected if I, if, I, if I espouse this now. But once I get elected, if I can do it, I will. So, so it's something that, that I just encourage for, for uh, um, my, my own students um, when, when we discuss uh, values versus strategy. Is, is, it's not that I don't have an answer, but I do believe that if it, people are at an advantage, if they're aware of when they're acting strategically and when they're acting in accordance with their values and when those are diverging. Um, so that if they are diverging, then there's a plan in place um, in order for the values to remain central and not to just give in to strategy. Could not agree more. Um, so I've got, I've got a, just a couple, a couple, uh, I think one, one other, uh, one or two other questions. Um, so, so you write a lot about leaders from previous centuries, and um, you write a lot about character, a lot about integrity, a lot about um, a lot about values. Um, is that is that just lost? Is are these are these gone? Is this a you know is this something that we just think of in terms of you know 100 and 200 years ago? Um, how, how do you make sense of kind of how our mores and norms have changed and how, how that impacts leaders? Um, well. I'm not. I'm not worried about you know the, about goodness and man's ability, men and women's ability to recognize it and access it and bring it into the world. I don't think that's changed at all. I think, um, and I think that I have many very interesting, serious, decent leaders on my own radar screen now, from you know Melinda Gates uh, to to you know. The students at Parkland High School, the young people mm-hmm. that will are made, have already made such a large impact, to Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, who staked one of the world's largest companies on environmental sustainability in Africa and is willing to take the hits of a short-term-oriented global equities market in order to do that. I mean, 
the, the world is rife, replete with decent leaders, many of them unnamed and unsung, doing the right thing from exactly the same foundation that we've been talking about with, ex- with healthy amounts of awareness between when you're acting strategically and when you're acting with your values, et cetera, and getting stuff done because in the end, you got to get it done. So I'm not worried about, about that. We, that is not the, the zeitgeist that is being offered to us by a salacious, fast-acting media and a, right now in America and other parts of the world. The p- officials in the highest public offices acting without decency and with integrity. We have too few examples of that. But the fact that right now, you know, nationalism and racism are on the rise around the, around the world in public office doesn't mean that lots and lots of decent people aren't getting lots of decent things done in exactly and making themselves into amazing people in exactly the same venue or frame or tenor warp and woof that I outline in 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 forged in crisis so it, it, it is up to us right what did was it was it, I think it was actually ultimately Edmund Burke not Nietzsche who said you know all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and let's add good women to do nothing that you know, th- that is really the challenge. How do we- it's funny. Almost, almost every quote ends up being a Nietzsche quote. It's every- <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I'm sure this is Burke and not Nietzsche, but in any event, yeah, yeah. The point is, my point is that the, the, the job is for all of us is not to take what's happening in at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or other right. parts of the national government and say, well, this is business done in a first class way. Uh, this is leadership in, with a white glove, and in, rather to say, how do we show up as good leaders, and how do we be inspired by other good leaders, and how do we go on not giving up or giving in or giving out to do what we believe we must to make the world a little bit better place in our way, with our gifts, and in our in, in the making of us. All right. Well, I'll, I'll end it on that uh, optimistic note. Um, really, it's been such a joy having you on the podcast. It's been uh, a real honor and amazing conversation. Well, thank you very much. I've so, I've so enjoyed it. And thank you for taking the time, Jeffrey. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the podcast today. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me at jeffshatton1 at gmail.com. You can tweet me at Jeff Shatton. If you like this podcast, press the subscribe button and make sure to rate it on iTunes so that other people can find it.